since we are late, I'll start right away. Can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> There can be no doubt that pieces of ivory elaborately carved with figurative imagery, some with part of the design inlaid with colorful glass, painted in colors or overlaid with gold foil, were made for display and consumption by royals and their entourage. The majority of Levantine ivory carvings of the Iron Age come from palatial contexts, even if many contexts are secondary. With their expansion to the West, the Assyrian kings accumulated these objects in their palaces and treasuries, thus stripping the Levantine kings of their prestige objects. The most frequently mentioned objects of ivory that Assyrian kings acquired from defeated Levantine kings are thrones and couches, precisely the pieces of ivory furniture that also occur in the Hebrew Bible. Think of Solomon's throne or the beds and couches in the prophet Amos' condemnation of the luxurious lifestyle at the court of Jeroboam II. The Hebrew Bible and late neo and royal inscriptions from Tikla Pileser III to Ezra Haddon speak metaphorically of palaces of ivory, perhaps a Levantine topos. Can I have the next please? The white uh, dispersion of the thousands of Levantine ivory carvings of the Iron Age, with a vast majority retrieved from Nimrud, ancient Kalhu, the capital of Assyria in the 9th to 7th century, was largely a function of Assyrian imperial policies and their aftermath. Despite its utter fragmentation, the assemblage from Samaria is the richest one from the Levantine capital. Other sizable assemblages of elaborate Iron Age uh, Levantine ivory carvings found in the Levant are those from Parma and Zingerli, here on the top of the list. Oh, now you can't see my arrow, I guess. So, <laughs> um, other, um, so Parma and Zingerli, whereas the finds from Phoenician cities are small, modest objects, and others from the southern Levant, either the same or late Bronze Age heirlooms and or epigones. The 273 pieces listed in the table under Samaria represent those published in the final excavation reports in 1924 and 1938. The next please. As some of you know, I have been working on a complete catalog and reassessment of the Samaria Ivories for some time. This project uh, has turned out much larger than projected originally counting with about 600 plus pieces based on field and museum numbers, I found about 12,000 fragments in museum storages, most of which tiny. Nearly a century after their discovery, there is much more and better research comparative material available, especially thanks to the nearly uh, complete publication of the Nimrud Ivories and the recent updated publication of the Ivories from Ars Vantash. Comparison with this material allows us to identify even very fragmented parts of the design, attribute them to a particular motif and get an idea of the original piece. Uh, this, however, requires an inspection of many often fragmented pieces on either side, partly due to the large variation in Levantine Iron Age ivory carvings, but also because often Numerous fragments, each depicting different parts of the design, can be attributed to sets of plaques that presumably decorated the same piece or set of furniture. The next, please. In order to contextualize the Samaria assemblage, I had to get a grip of, on the thousands of elaborate Levantine ivory carvings of the Iron Age. A main problem in this endeavor was the unsatisfying stylistic classification of the Nimrod ivories. Thus, I updated the inventory of all Levantine ivory carvings and devised a new subdivision that is not solely based on style and divorces the unsubstantiated affiliation of the presence and absence of Egyptianizing uh, features with Phoenicia and North Syria, respectively. As you can see in this table, I use more neutral labels for what was originally perceived as regional styles, 
but may in fact be more related to time than geography. Levantine one, for carvings largely lacking Egyptianizing features, Levantine two, for strongly Egyptianizing carvings, and Levantine three, for carvings with less strong, somewhat distorted Egyptianizing features and some Levantine one reminiscences. The further subdivision is based on object types, technology and imagery rather than style. And the subgroups within each large group are stylistically interrelated. Can I have the next? Uh, to clarify what I mean by Levantine one, two, three, I briefly show you the quint essence of each large group. The Levantine one group exhibits ties to late Bronze Age ivories in object types imagery and stylistic minutiae. It includes a large number of small scale objects, several of which revive late Bronze Age forms. Its inlaying technique with small pegs is distinct from that of the Levantine two and three groups, which are glued on a bed of print. Typical features include the animal markings, hatched surfaces, and the use of the guillotine band. So next, please. Aside from the subgroups categorized by object types, the Levantine one group includes two subgroups that stick out from all other Levantine ivory carvings as unusually coherent in terms of style. The backrests from Fort Chalmanesa's room SW7 on the upper left, and the much smaller so-called round-cheeked and ringleted subgroup, the rest of the ivories here, both of which have been attributed to 8th century Samal. There is, in my view, uh, these are, in my view, the only stylistic subgroups that can be attributed to a city state with some probability. Next, please. The Levantine II group includes largely plaques and fittings that probably decorated furniture and hardly any small scale objects. Many carvings are heavily inlaid in both the cloisonné and champ levé techniques adopted from Egypt, where they were used on jewelry and wooden objects. Some of the Egyptianizing motifs can be traced back to late Bronze Age adoptions of New Kingdom imagery, while others present new impulses from the contemporary Libyan dynasties. Typical realia include Egyptian wigs, headscarves, crowns, and aprons. The next please. The Levantine three group comprises mainly plaques that represent single figures or motifs, some furniture fittings in the round, a large group of bridal harness attachments, and a small group of other small scale objects. While the design of some pieces is incised and stained, as for example, the, at the bottom, the, the lotus garland, the majority are carved in solid or open work relief. Some relief plaques preserve gilding on the raised outlines of the design, as the one from Arslan Pash in the middle on the upper side, on the, on the top. And others exhibit minimal inlaying of some details, and a small group uses also cloisonne technique. Although many motifs are shared with the Levantine one and two repertoires, the Levantine three group has its own particularities in the way single elements are combined and also includes new motifs such as the woman at the window and the, and the stylized, uh, stylized palms on, your, on the bottom right. Egyptian realia are often misunderstood and distorted. This large group exhibits a larger stylistic variation regarding a realia, the figures' proportions, and the design's compositions. The next, please. Most of the Samaria ivories that preserve enough for an attribution to one of these large groups can be attributed to the Levantine three group and a still considerable number to the Levantine two group. Here are the first four on the upper row. Um, yet none are clearly Levantine one. In terms of object types, the Samaria assemblage comprises mainly plaques and some fittings, all of which could have been applied to furniture, even if one cannot entirely exclude the possibility that some might have been applied to small scale objects such as caskets, 
Yet there is no evidence for the typical small scale objects from other sites, such as cylindrical pixie dust flasks, palettes, fan handles, or bridle harness attachment. Thus, the subgroups pertaining to these oh. objects are missing from Samaria, while practically all other subgroups of the Levantine two and three groups are represented. The next, please. Comparanda uh, for the Samaria ivories come not surprisingly mainly from the large assemblages of Nimrud, but also from other sites, the rather homogeneous assemblages from Aslantash and Khor Sabab, both of which confined to Levantine three carvings, the Salamis assemblage confined to Levantine two carvings, and some pieces of the mixed assemblages from Sinjali and Tilbarsit. Comparanda from Nimrud, Aslantash, Hama, and Salamis can also be brought in evidence with regard to object types, technological aspects, and features marks. While some pieces find very close parallel, for example, the rosette rose on the, on the bottom left, most similarities are not precise in all aspects concerning not only imagery and style, but also object type, dimensions, carving, and mounting techniques. Some pieces, for example, the smiting pharaoh uh, carved in Chalavé in the middle, uh, remain without immediate parallels, even though they can be attributed to particular subgroups, in this case, the Chalavé subgroup. The next one, please. Before proceeding to more detailed comparisons, let me point out two stumbling blocks one encounters when studying Iron Age ivory carvings. First, our insufficient knowledge regarding the original assembly of the ivory carvings that likely decorated wooden furniture, which is the vast majority. And second, our ignorance regarding the producers of ivory carvings and their modes of production. The next, please. Ivory decorated furniture has come uh, down to us in extremely deficient state, disassembled and dispersed, as most of it was found not only in secondary contexts, but also in palaces that were destroyed, looted and vandalized in antiquity. Rare exceptions are the four reconstructed pieces of furniture from tomb 79 at Salamis on Cyprus, a bed, two chairs and a footrest, and the backrests found stacked in room SW7 of Fort Chalmaneser. These finds, however, can serve as models for reconstructing Levantine furniture only with reservations, since Ede and Chair Gamma appear uh, to be second-rate pieces assembled of recycled parts, as Marion Feldman observed. While the unusually homogeneous group of the SW7 backrests differs from oh, most of the ivory carvings in imagery and style. Nevertheless, they give a general idea of how ivory furniture might have looked like. The entire piece of furniture could be covered in decorated and or plain ivory, and elaborate carvings could be applied to headboards and backrests, of beds or chairs, and possibly also to the sides of chairs and thrones. The next piece. The use of visual representations of furniture for the location of actual ivory carvings is, lim is also limited. Uh, first, the usually monochrome representations carved in stone, metal, or ivory cannot represent the material of which the furniture was made. Second depiction are one dimensional. The chairs depicted on some SW7 ivory plaques, uh, as for example, the one here on the upper left, are seen in profile so that the decoration on their backrests remains invisible. Third, although depictions give us an idea of the types of furniture used in diverse contexts and their general shapes, they are rarely detailed enough for the recognition of individual plaques with figurative imagery. There are, however, some exceptions, as for example, the fragmentary orthostat of Farakib from Zingerli, showing him in banquet on an elaborate Levantine throne, the visible side of which includes uh, from bottom to top, a molded stretcher 
three rows of what appeared to be six stylized palms and a bunch of flowers spreading out from a semicircle in the arched top. Similar stretchers and stylized palms made of ivory have been found at various sites. Those stylized palms were also made of wood, as finds from Jerusalem revealed. And next, please. <coughs> Lacking factual texts on ivory carvers or artisans in general in the early Iron Age Levant, we can only speculate about modes of production based on the material itself. Silvana Di Paolo noted the absence of standardization and specialization within the material, which speaks against large palace workshops, as previously presumed. Marion Feldman interpreted the paradoxically blurred boundaries between smaller as well as larger groupings as a result of potentially fluid communities around them that crisscross the entire Levant multiple intersecting and overlapping networks of skilled artistic practices that could extend or contract across time and space. Can I have the next one? Using an anthropological approach, here Cathy, uh, Cassie Costin's parameters characterizing the organization of production, James Osborne recently proposed that the producers of Levantine ivory carvings were independent, dispersed, small-scale, and part-time, which according to Costin, uh, the next piece, falls under individual specialization defined as autonomous individuals or households producing for unrestricted local consumption. While I can uh, conceive of the producers as dispersed, small-scale, and part-time, a production for unrestricted local consumption cannot apply to luxurious ivory furniture. Such prestige items were made for kings and their entourage, but demand for them was restricted. Also, the circulation of elephant ivory and the gold applied to some works appears to have been restricted. Thus, the largely royal patrons probably supplied these materials to the artisans to whom they commissioned the work. Furthermore, it is noteworthy that none of the languages spoken in the ancient Near East had a term for a profession exclusively dedicated to carving ivory, as for example, the Latin eborarius. This together with the restricted demand may imply that the artisans who carved ivory also carved similar but easier available and cheaper materials such as bone, horn and wood. Their livelihood would then not have depended on royal commissions for carved ivory only. Such artisans may have worked on their own or in small public in related groups, which I call here production unit. <clears throat> okay, next slide please. Now, <coughs> with this in mind, let us now look at examples of very close parallels, all of which happen to come from Nimrud. In four cases, the comparanda are as far as preserved alike in every aspect, not only imagery in its rendering, but also formal aspects, such as type and dimensions of the plaques, their framing and carving and mounting techniques. The next, please. Uh, many small fragments from Samaria and numerous larger ones from Nimrud, a selection of which you see here. The Samaria ones are the ones on the, on the left and the three pieces on the right are from Nimrud and color photographs are always Samaria pieces and IN that you see often, often as a number in the, in the uh, parallels uh, refers to ivories from Nimrud and the volume number and catalog number. So, Many small fragments from Samaria and larger ones from Nimrud formed part of openwork plaques made of sections that depicted slender human-headed and ram-headed sphinxes in profile approaching half a stylized tree. Characteristic for this set is the lack of detail. The uniquely plain headscarves, colors, and aprons, maybe Elisa, you can show the headscarves, colors, and aprons on the Nimrud uh, pieces. Um, yeah, head color underneath is the color and, and there the apron, thank you. 
Um, while the deeply incised outline of human cheeks also occurs with some more detailed sphinxes of the same Levantine three subgroup, as does the rendering of the wings. The drawing on which the Samaria fragments are glued on the upper left is inaccurate as it was based on a plaque from Aslam Tash in lack of a better parallel at the time. Uh, the uh, next one. While the, the Samaria fragments add up to at least six plaques, the Nimrud ones add up to at least 21. A strip of six plaques would have fit across the backrest of a chair. It's here on the upper left, you see the lowest, uh, the lowest uh, panel shows six sphinxes uh, facing pairs of facing sphinxes, sphinxes facing each other. <laughs> And, as, uh, uh, and 21 plaques might have decorated either several chairs or run along the frame of a couch or a bed. Next slide, please. The next two interrelated cases depict striding sphinxes in relief and open work, respectively. Only five poor fragments of them were found in Samaria while Nimrud produced 11 larger and smaller fragments of the set carved in relief and one substantial fragment and several smaller ones of that carved in open work. Again, you see the Samaria pieces on the left. This small group of, uh, sorry, uh, both sets form part of Georgina Herman's finely carved style group. This small group of work is confined to depictions of sphinxes flanking stylized tree and features a stylistically homogeneous rendering of a number of unusual or infrequent details, together with distinct facial features. Characteristic is the dense patterning uh, uh, of details, such as the, the modeled wing feathers, the locks uh, of the uh, Egyptian wig that's in the, in the panel, the relief panel on top. I don't know if you can see it. it Oh, that's the next one already. Okay, the 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 the, the, the locks of the Egyptian wig is just a, a very fine grid pattern, and um, or also the 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 chevrons uh, on the aprons are very densely packed. Unique features include the color of the relief sphinx consisting of a single band of incised triangles framed by double lines. Um, I don't know if you can see that on the upper relief plaque, and that's why this tiny fragment on the left, the AO2502 D4, can be attributed to such a sphinx because this color doesn't occur on any other sphinxes. Other details, such as the, and the, uh, they're not, sorry, another detail that occurs only with this set is um, the, the tassels the striped bands on either side of the apron of the open work sphinx uh, underneath, uh, down there, down there, yes, that, that these tassels, and you see a little bit of it uh, left on this fragment from Samaria, uh, HU 1200-284. Other details such as the misunderstood, fo misunderstood folded wings incised along the back and haunch, the distorted double crown or the four feathers sticking out from the utmost covert of wings also occur with other Levantine three sphinxes. Now the next one, please. <coughs> An inventory of the surviving plaques of the entire group, the finely carved group, including those from Samaria, adds up as follows. There are uh, at least three large open work plaques and one smaller one depicting a full-face, human-headed, striding sphinx that's in, up, uh, on the upper middle. Uh, six large open-work plaques depicting a full-face, human-headed, push-short sphinx. That's the, the T2 and IN7 T2. There, there are many fragments that show that she's push-short. I can't show you everything here. Uh, two large open work plaques and a smaller one, each depicting a stylized tree that was probably once combined with a pair of full face sphinxes. Uh, and then uh, on the bottom row, 10 plus section of solid relief plaques, about half the size of the open work ones, depicting human headed sphinxes in profile arranged in pairs flanking a stylized tree. 
And you can see on IN7014 uh, on the left, the stylized tree, which it, with exactly the same details as the open work one on the upper left. And finally, there is also uh, one larger black card in low relief with a ram headed sphinx in profile. As you can see, there is some variation regarding dimensions, type of frame, carving technique, and details of the imagery. Yet, the stylistic homogeneity of this particular group of plaques with some unique features suggests that it represents the work of a single production unit at one point of time. All plaques may well have belonged to the same set of furniture. The next one, please. The last case of identical comparanda concerns open work stylized palms. In this case, about 40 plaques come from Samaria and only a few poor fragments of about five plaques from Nimrud. The plaques of this set measured 12 and a half to 13 times four to five centimeters and were two to three millimeters thick. If they were arranged as on Barakip's throne, the next slide please, that is in three friezes of six pieces, each on either side of the throne, such a throne would have required 36 plaques and would have been 24 to 30 centimeters wide without the legs, which seems too narrow. So if we count seven or eight pieces per frieze, this would result in 42 to 48 plaques and the width uh, without the legs of about 30 to 40 centimeters, which is more plausible. Thus, the entire set may theoretically have belonged to a single piece of furniture. The next, uh, please. <coughs> Nimrud has produced uh, 12 solid relief counterparts to this stylized palm that are identical in design and similar in dimensions but differ in practically all formal aspects, like thickness, carving technique, mounting technique, and type of frame. These differences may have been related to a different location on furniture. The two sets may then have belonged to, a different, to different pieces of furniture of a single set. In any case, the next slide, please. It seems plausible that they were produced by the same production unit since they contrast with the varied details of design and carving quality of other stylized palms of which you see a selection here. Now the next uh, slide please. Moving to comparisons with one or two dissimilar aspects the differences do not concern the same but different aspects. In one case, only the mounting technique differs. The plaque from Samaria was part of an identical rosette on a stalk as its Nimrud counterpart has a smooth reverse versus the striated reverse of the latter. The next piece. However, the motif of an encircled rosette on a curved stalk it occurs otherwise only on three, possibly four other plaques from Nimrud. It's, it's, uh, doesn't, uh, I haven't seen it in any other ivories. Uh, and, and all these plaques share the same thickness of three millimeters with the other, with the, uh, uh, the others and the one from Samaria, exhibit the same framing and are striated in different ways. They vary only slightly in scale, carving technique, low relief versus incision, and minute details such as the center of the rosette and the number of bands encircling it. Thus, it seems that these plaques were produced by the same production unit and may even have been mounted on the same piece of furniture. The next slide, please. Uh, in the case of these fragmentary narrow strips depicting rows of incised and polished rosettes against a rough, probably once painted background, the only difference between those from Samaria and Nimrud appears to be the slightly wider spacing of the latter. So these are all fragments of, of this 
a particular type of rosettes that I know of, the Samaria ones and the Nimit ones. But those from Samaria vary slightly in size. Some rosettes are a little bit smaller than others, but not greatly. Since these fragments are the only ones depicting such incised and polished rosettes against the probably painted background, one is tempted to attribute them to the same production unit. If put together in a single row, the strip would have been about 80 centimeters long, which makes one wonder whether all fragments belong to the same piece or set of furniture. Uh, next slide, please. Such strips might have decorated an ornamental chair back, similar to chair gamma from Salamis, which exhibits vertical rows of pioche and horizontal rows of palmettes or a scale pattern, respectively. The next slide, please. Moving to the next case, the only difference between these two plaques carved in cloisonné with an apparently identical figure, identical framing, identical striation on the reverse, and of a similar thickness, 3.6 versus 4 millimeter, appears to be the size. The Samaria one is a bit smaller. Only a tiny detail of the design differs otherwise. The way the flail is held on the Samaria plaque, the thumb is shown in front of the handle of the flail, while on the Nimrod plaque, it's shown behind more correctly behind. Both plaques exhibit a simple frame on the right and bottom edges only, suggesting that they were combined with other plaques. Uh, the next slide, please. <coughs> <coughs> and, they, <coughs> and so this combination might have resulted in an antithetical composition as depicted on three-sided furniture elements. That's why they have frames all around because they're on different sides that's now folded out, or this plaque uh, on the bottom, IN 499999+. Plus. Uh, since it is unusual to find the exact same images twice in strongly Egyptianizing scenes, the female figure on the Samaria plaque may have worn a crown, so may have been slightly different from, from the Nimrud parallel. In any case, the identical, nearly identical females from Nim Samaria Nimrud were probably carved by the same production unit, but less likely belong to the same piece of furniture due this, to the suggested composition of the scene and the difference in size. They may, however, have belonged to different pieces of the same furniture set. The next one, please. So the, the same probably applies to another case in which only the size of the plaques differ. Samaria produced the smallest plaque, while Nimrud produced three plaques of medium size and eight slightly larger ones. And the next one, one plaque of the latter set depicts a ram-headed rather than a human-headed uh, sphinx. Uh, no, that's the previous one, the next. Yes, thank you. Here you see the, the ram-headed one and um, so with ex the exact same details of the wing, the color, the apron, and even the eyes with only with the pupil only uh, incised. And uh, they also, these plaques have the exact same fl floral background. You see this, what, what Georgina Herman called the triple flower behind the sphinx, and then half a stylized tree uh, at, the, at the left edge of the, uh, the other one is not preserved. Um, all these plaques share not only all details of the imagery, but also their rendering, the thickness of the plaque, the high relief, the mounting technique, and the smooth reverse. Uh, next, please. Another 20 plaques from Nimrud depict identical human and ram-headed sphinxes striding on the heads and hands of a pair of kneeling uh, youths. And the next one, moreover, one plaque of the medium-sized set exhibits the same type of sketches and randomly placed alphabetic letters on its reverse as a solid uh, relief palm. Uh, you can see these branches. Can you see them on the reverse? I can't point them out yet. 
these branches uh, on the reverse of this plaque and the one of the palm are exactly the same. And then this, um, these letters, which obviously are not fetus marks, but just ram randomly put letters as if uh, uh, an artist was trying out different alphabetic letters and making sketches, seems, uh, seem to stem from the same hand. So if so, then in this case, we can connect different motifs to a single production unit and possibly a single set of furniture. The next piece. The last case I'm showing you today consists of a complete plaque and a number of fragments, not all illustrated here, of open work plaques with triple frames on top and bottom that depict somewhat clumsily executed sphinxes in a floral surrounding. And they find close parallels in a set of four fragmentary openwork plaques. You see one of them on the lower left and uh, a solid relief uh, plaque from Nemo. In this case, the facial features and the clumsy rendering of the sphinx's body seem to betray a common authorship while details of the imagery vary in design, the crowns, the headscarves, the aprons, and the plants. Georgina Herman attributed all these pieces to her Bikino style group. However, there are also some stylistic differences between the Samaria Nimrod pieces, as for example, the ears of the Sphinx on the solid relief black, ah, ah and sorry, and, um, and the Sphinx on the solid relief black exhibits puffier cheeks. The next piece. Moreover, the Bikino style group is not straightforward. Its composition changes from one ivory, ivories from Nimrud volume to another, and Elena Shiliuto proposed yet another composition. This case is not isolated. In fact, it is a typical example of the difficulties in identifying authorship beyond single sets of furniture. It is interesting to note that Herman drastically reduced the group in the latest IN volume on uh, the, the last uh, column uh, on, the, on the right, in which one, uh, in this volume, one can also observe a partial retraction from style groups in favor of groups based on former features or motifs. The next piece. Yet even the latest, much reduced Bikino style group is not really convincing. Although these works share some iconographical details and a somewhat clumsy rendering, their attribution to a common authorship remains questionable, as there is no unique feature that unites them. In fact, following Morelli, the different rendition of the ears would speak against it. I hope you can see the ears of the sphinxes. The next slide, please. <coughs> I have proposed to interpret the closest parallels between ivory carvings from Samaria and Nimrud in terms of a common authorship, and except for the last case, likely belonging to the same piece or set of furniture. This raises the question of whether it is feasible that parts of the same furniture set ended up in two different cities. Okay. The find context. Right. Oh, that's good. That's a nice photo. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Huh? Sorry? Right. Okay, I continue. This, uh, so the find context is no, not much light on this question, except for affirming the deficient, disassembled, and dispersed state in which ivory furniture was retrieved. The utterly fragmented assemblage from Samaria was largely found in Hellenistic and Roman debris, while Nimrud suffered a great deal of destruction, looting and vandalism during the invasions that brought uh, the end of the Assyrian Empire between 614 and 612, before our time, and meters of debris at Fort Chalmaneser, where the closest comparanda come from, attest to squatter occupations for some time after uh, 612. For two reasons, I can conceive of the possibility that parts of the same furniture set came to light in these two places. First, factual Assyrian texts reveal that war booty could be shared and precious objects given to Assyrian officials. 
And second, Samaria became the seat of an Assyrian governor after Israel was annexed in 720. Thus, sets of furniture might have been torn apart during Samaria's conquest, with some pieces taken to Nimrud, while others remained at Samaria or returned there after booty sharing. A similar case uh, can be shown uh, for the Aslantash ivories. The next slide, please. <coughs> what else can we learn from the comparison of ivory carvings from Samaria and Nimrud? Three points regard methodology. First, it is indispensable to take into consideration not only imagery and style, but also formal aspects such as format and dimensions, engraving and mounting technique. Second, a meaningful comparison. Excuse me. Oh. A meaningful comparison requires looking at all closely related material, not only select examples. And third, uh, it also requires to contemplate its possible location on furniture. <coughs> Although our knowledge of ivory decorated furniture is rudimentary, it is clear that a piece of furniture would have comprised many plaques and that certain motifs could be repeated many times. As for example, the up to 48 stylized palms on a, a single throne's sides. Thus, some groups of stylistically homogeneous plaques, as for example, the so-called finely carved group, can be seen as the work of a single artisan or production unit made for a single piece or set of furniture at one point in time, rather than a style group. The next slide, please. How do we identify such ensembles? Some exhibit one or more unique features, such as the plain headscarves, collars, and aprons of the first case, or the dense patterning of details, such as unique collar or unique uh, apron tassels of the finely carved group. Other ensembles exhibit a unique combination of particular images, uh, imagery, style, and formal aspects, as for example, the stylized palms, or the Sphinx is carved in deep solid relief on sectional plaques on the lower left. At the same time, all ensembles share other features with other ivory carvings. Moreover, ensembles including plaques that do not correspond in every aspect can slightly vary in any aspect, format, dimensions, carving technique, mounting technique, and or imagery. <clears throat> so within a set, you can have all this variation also. This implies that the producers of ivory carvings did not specialize on particular formats, carving techniques or motifs, which makes it unlikely that they worked in large workshops from which one would expect some standardization and specialization. On the whole, the large and entangled variation in this body of material is precisely what hampers and needs stylistic classification. In other words, while it's relatively easy to identify the work of an artisan or production unit on a piece or set of furniture at one point in time, it is practically impossible to follow their work over time. This is suggested mode of production of largely independent, dispersed, small-scale and part-time producers would then also explain the stylistic variation in the assemblage of Samaria. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll be very grateful for any comments and suggestions you may have.